Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. A helicopter crash is a nightmarish worst case scenario for any flight crew. However, the risk factor increases exponentially if the crash happens in or over water. This is why pilots and other helicopter crew members undergo comprehensive underwater egress training. These exercises prepare these men and women for emergency situations involving water landings or ditching and equip them with the skills and knowledge necessary to safely escape from an aircraft that has come to rest in water. The training generally starts in a pool where the crew members are taught to use emergency respirators and to escape their seats quickly and effectively. In many cases, an entire mock helicopter will be used to increase the realism of the exercise further. Once pool training is complete, crews will get a chance to train in a more realistic environment. Typically, this exercise takes place in a river or lake and includes both helicopter and airplane pilots. The goal here is to simulate what it might be like to maneuver in the water, wearing a full flight suit, life jacket, and, in the case of the fighter pilots, a parachute. <laughs> During the exercise, pilots will also learn how to use the survival equipment available in their aircraft, such as life vests, inflatable rafts, and signaling devices. They will also cover post-egress procedures, such as swimming away from the wreckage, providing first aid to themselves or others if necessary, and signaling for rescue. The last ride, what you might think of as the graduation ride, they are blindfolded, they have a rubber rifle, they have a flag jacket that they have to remove, and then they have to move down, locate an exit again while blindfolded and safely and successfully egress all while breathing compressed air. Marines are unique in the military world because they operate on both land and water. As such, they often need to undergo special training to ensure they are adequately prepared for whatever they might encounter. In this case, they are training to properly escape an assault vehicle that has become waterlogged or is actively sinking. The simulator uses a full-sized replicate of such a vehicle capable of rotating 180 degrees in the water. This helps increase the overall realism of the situation. Just like with the pilots, the primary goal of these training scenarios is to teach the troops to remain calm, regardless of the situation. A safe egress is usually easy to achieve, provided people avoid panicking and focus on getting themselves out of the vehicle as quickly as possible. Incidents involving water are far from the only situations in which soldiers can be known to panic. <laughs> Though it is routine for paratroopers to jump out of airplanes, the same cannot be said for pilots and RIOs.
That's why these men and women often go through parachute training alongside one another. By learning the various techniques of controlling a parachute, as well as what to do when things go wrong, they can prevent a panic situation several thousand feet above the ground. Contrary to popular belief, most parachute training takes place at sea level. At these facilities, troops will learn all about various parachute techniques, including executing a safe landing and dealing with unforeseen circumstances. You're going to have to contend with as you're making your way underneath here. I'm treading water right now. Nobody else? Very, very good. One device used during these exercises is known as the lateral drift trainer. This is essentially a zip line that allows crew members to practice a series of landing techniques designed to reduce the instance of injuries in emergency situations. The ability to exit an aircraft safely in the case of an emergency may seem essential today, but it is actually a relatively recent development. In the early days of flight, pilots and crew members would have to bail out by opening doors and canopies and then jumping away from the aircraft. This resulted in numerous casualties over several decades until the introduction of the ejector seat. Modern ejection seats use explosive bolts and rocket propulsion to rapidly and safely eject pilots and crew members from an aircraft. Because they work so quickly, they minimize the chances that a pilot might come into contact with any part of the plane. That said, they are incredibly complex systems and must be maintained to ensure they work correctly. For instance, Regular inspections are conducted to check the overall conditions of the seat, including its mechanical components, pyrotechnic devices, wiring, and safety systems. These inspections often involve disassembling and inspecting individual components, cleaning and lubricating parts, and performing non-destructive testing to identify any faults or defects. Um, safety ties on right hand, uh, drogue riser leg. The seats also undergo scheduled maintenance at specific intervals or flight hours. When it comes to maintaining and testing ejector seats, few drills are more iconic than the rocket sled test. It involves using a rocket-powered platform, or in later cases, a mock-up of an aircraft fuselage to simulate the dynamic conditions experienced during an ejection sequence. The primary purpose of ejector seat rocket sled testing is to assess the performance and reliability of ejection seats. However, as survivability rates for low altitude ejections improved, the rocket sled also became a way to evaluate how an ejection might physically and mentally affect the crew members. In some cases, pilots will even volunteer to ride the rocket sled so they can get a feel for the real thing.
From the early days of flight up until now, these men and women have had to push their bodies to the limit day after day. One of the most recognizable pieces of pilot training equipment is the high-G centrifuge. This indoor apparatus consists of a mock cockpit and a rotating arm. It is capable of spinning at different speeds in order to simulate various levels of gravitational force. The main objective of centrifuge training is to familiarize pilots with the physiological effects of high g-forces and to aid them in developing techniques to mitigate their impact. Extreme G-forces, whether positive or negative, can impose significant stress on the human body, including blurred vision, temporary blindness, and unconsciousness. Just, the nice thing about it is, is it restricts the head motion just a little bit, just like the real helmet. Any of these conditions would pose a huge problem for a pilot in flight. In recent years, the U.S. military has developed a range of new ways to prepare their pilots for the rigors of flight. One of the best examples of this new approach to pilot training is the Naval Medical Research Unit, Dayton's Disorientation Research Device, also known as the Kraken. The Kraken is designed to induce controlled and predictable sensory illusions to simulate various disorienting conditions a pilot might encounter. It typically consists of a simulated cockpit that can tilt, rotate, or move in different ways while the main platform is spinning, and it is integrated with visual displays and other sensory components. Unfortunately, spatial disorientation is a real problem for pilots, as it prevents them from perceiving their true position and motion in space. Like the centrifuge, this spinning device helps pilots and military medical professionals study the effects of disorientation, develop countermeasures, and explore ways to enhance human performance and safety. While the centrifuge and Kraken may be unpleasant, Few pilot training methods are as dreaded as the intense hypoxia training chamber, also known as altitude chambers or hypobaric chambers. These specialized facilities are designed to simulate high altitude conditions and familiarize pilots with the effects of oxygen deprivation. During the process, pilots will enter the chamber, which will then be pressurized or depressurized to simulate different altitudes. The chambers can also mimic rapid decompression scenarios and emergency situations, all while under the close supervision of medical personnel. it may be extreme, it's all part of preparing pilots and air crewmen for the real challenges they'll face every day. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.